So in Genesis chapter 3, we are going, first of all, to read the, the whole chapter, but today we will just look at the first seven verses of it. Uh, my name is John Paul Semakula, and I'm um, one of the members of this church and of this community. And it's such a blessing to be with God's people, to worship and praise him with one voice. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God indeed said, you shall not eat from every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasing to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put an enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cast is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat from it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. For dust you are and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand to take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, our Father, we want to thank you, Lord, First of all, for who you are, the everlasting one. You are God who is so gracious. 
who is so merciful, who is so kind, who is so loving. The word says, the Lord, you have not treated us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. But you give us grace. And Lord, as we go through this text this morning, we pray and ask of you that may your spirit be our teacher today, O oh Lord. I pray that the spirit will be with my mouth. May the spirit will be, may he be with our ears and our hearts. The Lord, that word which cannot return to you void, may it do its work in our hearts. The Lord, our hearts should be broken and changed. That our hearts should be transformed by your word. Lord, as David once prayed, I also pray that you open our eyes, that you may see the wondrous things from your law. We give you praise. We give you honor. In Jesus, our Lord, God, and our Savior, we bless your name, O Son of God. To you who loved us and washed us from our sins in your own blood, and you have made us a kingdom of priests to your God and Father. To you be all the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, today we will look at the temptation which led to the fall. Uh, we look at what the scripture says and the lessons we, uh, we as Christians of today and hopefully those who don't believe yet in Jesus, we learn. Genesis is the book in all the books of the Bible which has received and continues to receive the highest kind of criticism. From the world. The second book to that is the book of Revelation. Uh, and, and it makes sense because this is the first book of the Bible, and Revelation is the last book of the Bible. So that tells you a lot how the world feels about the Word of God. So I believe uh, Genesis receives so much criticism because Genesis tells us the origins. Most especially the origins of sin and evil and of the strategies of Satan. And the book of Revelation testified to us that in the end, God and righteousness are going to triumph over sin, wickedness, and Satan. So we know that Genesis tells us that Satan has a beginning and Revelation tells us he has an end. He's not an equal to God. Uh, we have been this... We have been singing this beautiful song, You are the Alpha and the Omega. God is the Alpha. He is the beginning. And the Omega is the end. The, the end. All the first and the last. So today, many seminaries which train pastors around the world, it is very sad that many of them don't teach that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are literal. That this is real history. They deny it. And actually, I, I was listening to something a while ago where they say that actually, like in the West, like in America, I think also in Europe, these are the highest numbers. They don't believe that this is actually things which really happen. They will say this is allegory. Like these are, these are just like parables. It is not really true. You know, that means that they deny the 24-hour, seven-day creation account. They deny the great flood of Noah. They deny the story of the Tower of Babel as historical. But make no mistake, the rest of the Bible, Jesus Christ and his apostles, they believed and they took the first 11 chapters of Genesis as literal history. Jesus believed in an actual Adam and Eve, believed in Noah. In fact, when he speaks about his second coming, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days when the Son of Man returns. Jesus believed in Abel because he says, that generation which crucified him from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, it will be accounted to them. So the same as the apostles when they write, so we see that the Bible is a whole unit. You don't have a right to say that this is not true. This is true. Then there you just believe in yourself. But the word of God is to be taken as a whole. And those who deny, most especially the, 11, the first 11 chapters of the Bible in the book of Genesis, 
They are denying the very foundation of redemptive history. Because if Genesis is not literal, the cross doesn't make sense. Jesus is coming to die for our sins. It doesn't make any sense. So in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says that therefore just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So here is the sentence and the verdict of heaven upon us all. Here the Bible testified that all of us naturally we are born under sin. Not just under sin, but also in sin we are conceived. And because of that, Adam was our federal head. He passed on his fallenness to all of us that we are born. Uh, someone say that we do not... We are not sinners because we sin, but we sin because we are sinners. It is to our nature, to the core of our being, that we are fallen. And thereby, the Bible makes it clear that we all need a Savior, without exception. All of us. That's why the only exception was the second Adam who entered creation without a human father. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 1 of our text in Genesis chapter 3, the scriptures begin with, Now the serpent was more cunning than all crafty than any beast the Lord God had made. The serpent. Here the tempter came in the shape and likeness of the snake. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 identifies this serpent as Satan. And the devil. In Revelation 12 9, it says, So that great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. So this serpent is actually Satan. So by the time Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 happens, the fall of Satan had happened before that. Had happened before Genesis 3, had happened. Actually, it had happened before Genesis 3, 1, but after Genesis 1, 31, after God had created everything, where he said, behold, everything is good. So we know that in between there, chapter 1 and chapter 3, that is where Satan and uh, angelic rebellion happened in heaven. So, Ezekiel chapter 28 from verse 8. Verse 12 to 15 describes Satan before his fall as the most beautiful creature God had ever made. He was the seal of perfection. The Bible says he was perfect in beauty. He was created as an angel of light and the most prominent angel in heaven. That's why later I would lead a third of the angels to join him in their rebellion against God. When you look at Ezekiel 28, it shows that actually he was a lead of worship in heaven. But Ezekiel 28 verse 17, I'll just read that verse. It says, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So here the Bible says that Satan's sin began by the corruption of his own beauty. His own beauty corrupted him. And when you read in Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 17, the Bible tells us that his fall had to do with his desire to be equal to or even greater than God himself. Where he was seeking his own glory apart from the glory of God, where he was seeking to set his will against the will of God. There you have the five I will statements of the devil. Actually, the first I will statements which turned a holy angel into the devil. In, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 17. So we need to remember that Satan, being a fallen angel, he was an archangel. Therefore, he was, or he is, a supernatural spirit. So it is believed that Satan actually possessed, entered the serpent. Because it is presented here, Moses writes to us and it just says the serpent. But the rest of the scripture tells us the serpent was Satan. Inside the serpent, the serpent was just a vessel 
Satan used to do his, his work of wickedness. So, you know, uh, this serpent which Satan had possessed must have been a very beautiful creature for Satan to choose to use it. If you look at 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14, the Bible says, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. When Satan comes to deceive, he always comes as a good thing, as something attractive, as something appealing. So that's why in the story you see Eve is not afraid of the serpent. That means there was nothing to fear about the serpent then. There was nothing to scare Eve away. The serpent must have been something very beautiful. That even Eve had to have a longer conversation with it. Later we see it wasn't a good idea. So before the curse was pronounced, uh, in Genesis chapter 3 where we read verse 14 to 15, the serpent, there it, it, we have the curse of the serpent. So we know that the serpent was different than what we know today as a serpent. So this creature didn't start as a snake as we know it. It was different. The snakes we have today, they are under, in the sense, the species under the curse of God. As we see them, that's why for us, naturally, they are scary. But this, the serpent look, didn't exactly look like snakes we know today. It, has, it must have been a very beautiful creature. In fact, today, uh, sorry, uh, before when I was studying for these takes, I found out that one of the, some of the highest ranking angels of heaven are called seraphims. Seraphims, or seraph in singular, seraph means a fiery serpent. They, the word literally means fiery serpents, burning serpents. So, maybe the seraphs looked like how the serpent looked like before the fall, before its curse. So here he says that, uh, the scripture says that he came to the woman. He said to the woman, I'll first talk about the woman. So we see that the woman, here the woman is Eve, was the object of his attack, being the weaker vessel who needed protection from Adam, the husband. Though Eve, by this time, was sinless, we see that she was seducible and temptable. Yes, Eve was sinless. She was perfect by this time, but she was, she was, she was able to be seduced and tempted. So I do believe that this is very intentional for Satan to do. Satan is very, very intentional at the things he does. You see here, the scripture says that he came specifically to the woman, not to the man. He came to Eve. And also, Satan, when he showed up, he showed up as an animal, as a serpent. We know that Satan is an angel. He's a very high-ranking angel, very powerful. Though he's fallen, he still retains the attributes of an angel. That's why none of us, we are unequal to him. He's very powerful. The only protection we have is God on our lives. So we see that Satan did not come as an angel to Eve. He came as an animal. So Eve probably thought was just talking to a snake, to a serpent. So you see, in the scriptures, we know that Satan is always seeking to overthrow the order of God. He wants to overthrow the commandments of God. He's a leader of rebellion against God. You know, in the Bible, God is the highest authority. There is no high authority above God. God is the highest authority. And then the next authority are actually angels. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says that man, humans, Mankind was created a little lower than the angels. So you have God, you have angels, then you have humans. And among us humans, when you read 1 Corinthians 11, it says the head of the woman is the man. So you, in authority, you have then the man, the woman, and under human beings, you have animals. The rest of the animals. So this plot 
of the first sin is very, very intentional. When Satan came to lead the fall, he showed up as an animal. Remember, animals are at bottom. Then he convinces the woman. He's going like the, the Lord of God is like this. He's coming down like he's, he's attacking the opposite direction. So the serpent convinces the woman to do something God, the highest authority, and even Adam. Because we know in chapter 2, God only spoke to Adam. Adam spoke to Eve, which Adam had told Eve not to do. So Eve obeys the serpent or submits to the serpent. And where we read, after she submits to the serpent and eats, she gives to Adam who submits to Eve, and all of them disobey God. So, this was very, very intentional and thereby overturning the order of God. You know, when it comes to the church, the church is the new created people of God, created in Christ Jesus. When God says order in church, you know, the New Testament is very, very clear about how the church should be and what kind of church leadership God has set in place. You find that uh, we have leadership roles or responsibilities of men and women inside a local church, inside the church of Jesus Christ. And we see that the reason which God, through the Apostle Paul, gives when he forbids women from being, uh, he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over men in the context of the church. The reason God gives, it takes us back to Genesis chapter 3. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, sorry, chapter 2, verse 12 to 14, this is what the Bible says. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. You know, this is a very controversial thing today. Many people don't like this, but this is not about what we like or we don't like. I'm here to tell you what the Bible says. So, Verse 13 says, here is the reason why God forbids women from this. He says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So you see, the reason here given has nothing to do with culture or education as many people espouse. It has everything to do with the order of creation and the fall. This is beyond time. This is beyond our present day culture. This is the order of God. So the devil took advantage of Eve when she was alone. You know, most of the temptations which come to us, they come to us in our solitude. When we isolate ourselves. In fact, Proverbs 18 warns, warns it says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. So Eve was isolated. And we find that, we find actually many examples in the Bible. An example of David. King David, when you read First Samuel, I don't know if he, Second Samuel, I think Second Samuel. When David, when he was supposed to be in war fighting, joining his men, he was alone at home walking on the top of his roof. And behold, he saw a woman bathing, you know the rest of the story. So we have to watch out for ourselves as Christians. We have to watch out because, you know, the fellowship of saints contributes much to our strength as believers and our safety. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, this is what the Bible says. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as it is the man of some. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see that they are approaching. There is safety in the communion of saints. Most of the times when we fall, I, I tell you this as from a personal experience, but also I know we are all humans. Most of the times when we fall for temptation, we are alone. You know, we see that Satan also took advantage by finding her 
by finding Eve near the forbidden tree. And probably Eve was gazing upon it out of curiosity. You know, uh, the Garden of Eden was a very, very big garden. Like when you read Genesis 2, it tells you the kind of area. It's, the Garden of Eden itself is way bigger than Uganda. Think about it. Now, imagine you are here, you are Adam and Eve. And let's say that the center of the Garden of Eden is somewhere in central Uganda like in Kamuli. In all places, you want to hang around the forbidden tree. You know, the, the truth is, uh, how many times have we fallen into sin by looking? In other words, by looking at things we know we shouldn't. Christians, you know we have a standard. Our standard is the scriptures, not, the, not other Christians and not the culture around us. There are certain things Christians are not supposed to look at. There are certain movies Christians should not watch. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You know the truth is, personally, I will avoid watching certain movies, even if someone is enjoying the movie, but after finding out the kind of content, maybe inside the movie, or the kind of content inside the music, or even known to go to certain places, not because I consider myself strong. I consider myself weak. I am weak. I will fall. And here is a warning. The Bible warns us, in, like in Philippians chapter 3, to take no confidence in the flesh. That is when you end up falling. The book of Proverbs says, who walk on hot coals and his feet does not get seared. Who puts fire in his bosom and his clothes don't, are not lit up. If you are playing around sin, you are going to fall. You know, those that would not eat the forbidden fruit must not come near the forbidden tree. It's wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, verse, when you read uh, verse 14 and 15, uh, there the scripture says, I'll just read, concerning sin, uh, verse 14 and 15, the Bible says in Proverbs 4, do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. This is wisdom from God. Don't go there. Don't even walk towards that direction. We are commanded to flee all youthful lusts. To flee from them. Not to them. You know, the serpent said to the woman, has God said? So Satan's first attack is on the credibility of the word of God. He shoots fiery darts of doubt concerning God's word to all of us. This is why in the spiritual armor God has given to believers, when you read uh, Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 12, going down, you have the believer's armor, and in the arm of the believers you have the shield of faith. And Paul writes and says the shield of faith is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And the Bible also says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, Satan begins this temptation here. In other words, Satan is putting a question mark where God placed a full stop. And you know, like when we start to wander away from the ways of God, it begins by questioning some things God has clearly spoken. In the pretense of it not being clear. You know, the truths of the Bible, most of them are not hard to understand. They are not. They are just hard to accept. People don't want to accept it. Like when you read in the Gospels, when Jesus Christ taught, when he taught about himself and the kingdom of God, Jesus, the things he taught were clear. They were easy to understand. But the Bible says the people were not willing to receive them. They had no place of truth in their hearts. So, 
When it comes to unbelief in the Bible, unbelief is not a problem of the brain that you have an intellectual incapacity. It's not that you, you cannot reason so well. It's not so much about that. It's the issue of the heart. It is always the issue of the heart. That people don't believe the truth. When the Bible says we shall not commit adultery or flee sexual immorality, what is hard to understand about that? When the Bible forbids us to gossip, when the Bible forbids us all those things, they're not hard to understand. The issue is the heart. We don't normally like the truth. So we we will buy the things that maybe the Bible is not clear about that. Look at the Western world, Europe, America, most especially North America. Look at what they are doing with homosexuality. That the Bible is not so clear about these things, really. You mean Genesis is not clear when God burnt up Sodom and Gomorrah for sexual immorality, most especially homosexuality. You mean Romans 1 is not clear. It is clear. The issue is not about whether it is clear or not. It is about the heart. The love of sin. Where sin is cherished, truth will be rejected. And where truth is cherished, sin will be rejected. You know, here, there is a question I may ask. Is the word of God enough for you as a person? Or do you need other external validations to what God has already spoken? <laughs> I think it was Billy Graham who said, even if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the big fish, I would believe it. Because it's in the Bible. So, is the Bible enough for you? Do you need uh, human philosophers and supposed scientists to come uh, and convince you that the creation account is not true, but evolution is true? And many people even inside the church have bought such lies. This is not science. These are doctrines of demons in the name of science. You know, God deemed his word enough for Adam and Eve. It is very, very interesting that in Genesis Chapter 2, before chapter 3, where we began reading from, God never warned Adam and Eve that there is a devil out there. Never. God didn't tell them, beware, there will be a devil coming to tempt you. Or there will be a, a serpent, convince, try to convince you to disobey me. He never said that. But what God did for Adam and Eve, he gave them his word. His word was clear. You shall not eat from the fruit of this tree. The day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Simple. And as long as Adam and Eve kept themselves in the word of God, in obedience to it, they were okay. That is where true protection is. You know, someone said, and this is true, a man is immortal as long as he's in the will of God. When you are doing the will God has called you to do, it doesn't matter what comes against you. You are immortal until that is done. So in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, we are told about temptation. And, you know, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with a temptation will also make a the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Eve had the way of escape. The moment Satan questioned the word of God as God said, that would have been the end of the conversation and Eve walks away from the serpent. But she stayed. Every time, I promise you, I know this 100%, it's true. This scripture. Every time a Christian, I will speak as an from the perspective of a Christian, because unbelievers, they cherish temptations. Temptations, they take them as opportunities, not as something to fight against. But whenever a temptation comes to a Christian, God will always show you a way of escape in a moment. Let me say you're about to watch something you know you shouldn't watch. Even a scripture can come to your mind. But if you shut your heart, that's it. You start justifying certain things. Even if it comes to gossiping. Before you open your mouth to start speaking ill about other people. 
you will feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit telling you to stop. That is the way of escape. God is always faithful that none of us can excuse our own temptations. That it was too much for me, God. He says God is the one who is faithful to give us a way out. So, you know, Satan still uses the same devices until now. Uh, the moment he makes you to doubt the word of God, he has partially won the battle. The moment doubt comes in your mind, when it comes to the word of God, in the midst of the temptation, just know that Satan is beginning to win. He tried the same kind of temptation with Jesus Christ, the second Adam. Uh, this is recorded in Luke chapter uh, in Luke chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus, and even it is also recorded in, uh, in Matthew chapter 4. You know, Satan tried to make Jesus doubt what God had previously said about him. When God confessed who Jesus Christ is audibly in the Bible, there are only few moments, few places, few times where God audibly speaks from heaven and people hear the voice and this is one of them when god the father from heaven speaks about jesus this is what god says in luke chapter 3 verse 21 to 22 this is what the bible records it says when all the people were baptized it came to pass that jesus also was baptized and while he prayed the heaven was opened and the holy spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him and the voice came from heaven which said you are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. You see the first temptation of Jesus. When Satan tempts him in the wilderness is this. If you are the son of God. That was the first one. Not to turn uh, bread into stones. That came later. The first one was to make Jesus doubt if he is the son of God. God had spoken clearly who Jesus is. You know, Satan is very subtle. Satan didn't say, since you are the son of God, oh, because you are the son of God, then do this. He says, if, it's a condition. If you are the son of God. And that's how Satan subtly comes to us. As God really said about whatever thing you're going through, where God has spoken, has spoken very, very clearly. So he says to the woman, he says as God, in verse 1, where he said that, he said to the woman, as God indeed said, you shall not eat from the, every tree of the garden. This is not what God said exactly. Satan took God's positive command, which shows his generosity and goodness. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, this is what God said. From every tree of the garden you may freely eat. From every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat the fruit of it, you shall surely die. But this is how Satan phrases it. Has God indeed said you shall not eat from every tree? Of the garden. So Satan is trying to make God look mean here. He's it, saying God is really mean. You mean God has stopped you from eating from every tree of the garden? No, that's not what God said. God created millions of trees of fruits for Adam and Eve. He just gave them one exception. This one you shall not eat from it. And you know. Every time we sin, it is because we are less satisfied in God. We look at God as being mean and restrictive in keeping, like the one who is keeping us from all the fun. And at the same time, looking at sin as attractive, as something that will make us happy, as something that will bring satisfaction to us. This applies to every kind of sin we commit. People who fall into sexual immorality, God has told us to flee all kinds of sexual morality, whether it is adultery for the marriage, whether it is fornication for those who are not married, and fornication carries any form of sexual immorality, whether it is pornography or anything like that, homosexuality. Today, 
you will find actually in our culture, but it's almost everywhere now, people even inside the church, you find professing Christians who will say we are born again and we are indwelt by the Spirit of God, and they are not a single bothered about cohabitation. They are living in gross sexual immorality. And they will find justifications for such things. You know, it's okay with us. So it must be okay with God. You know, our friends are okay with it. So it must be okay with God. God has his own standards and doesn't bow down to the standards of men. You know, like when people enter into such sins, God forbids us from committing such sins to protect us because he loves us. The same thing we see here in the Garden of Eden. God forbade Adam and Eve from eating from this tree because he loved them. Not the opposite. And you see when they ate, what happened? And we have so many misery. Some of us, we became orphans at very young age because our parents died too early and much of it had to do with sexual immorality. Like how many people like are, are, are still plunged in a chain of poverty because of early pregnancies and all these things. God commands us to get married, to have real marriage, a covenantal sex for our protection. As simple as that. When it comes to examples of dress codes, and this is mostly, uh, of course, even young men uh, and men also fall into that, but this mostly falls on the side of the women. When women dress immodestly, they are trying to seek attention. You know, if you know your identity in Christ, you will not seek cheap attention from men to feast on you with their eyes and to, to look at you as a sex object, not as something precious. That's why people don't get. This is all God is giving us his commands because he loves us and because he wants to protect us. When God forbids us from being drunkards, look at what alcohol wrecks families and lives. It's not that God hates people. When he forbids us, when the scripture warns us of sorcery, where sorcery actually includes abusing drugs, look at what drugs do to people. You know, we have an example of the nation of Israel. First of all, we see that Satan will always seek to make God's commands look negative. When in fact they are for our good and protection, you know, for the nation of Israel, this is a reason why only two Israelites entered the promised land of all those who came out of Egypt, of that generation. The scripture says that Israel spent most of their time complaining and grumbling against God. They forgot all the promises God had given them of the promised land, of his blessing. God had already rescued them from the, heart, from the land of slavery. They were slaves. But along the way to the promised land, it was filled with complaining, questioning God, testing God, rejecting God. And most of them died in the wilderness. Most of them didn't cross. Only Joshua and Caleb made it to the other side. The Bible says they were made of another spirit. The rest, their carcasses remained in the desert. You know, if you find God's commandments burdensome and you don't find delight in them, when you read the commandments in the Bible, you scoff at them in your heart. You don't like what God says. You don't like when God forbids you to, this, to do certain things. It is evident you're not saved. That's simple and clear. You need a new heart. The scripture, when it speaks about salvation, God doesn't come to you and treat your heart. God gives you another one. Another heart of flesh. A heart which loves his law. A heart which delights in his commandments. In 1 John chapter 5 verse 3 says, And this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. If you find the commandments of God as a burden to yourself on your heart, you need to repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ. I don't care who you are. 
because the Bible doesn't care who you are. There are no exceptions. So you see, when you become saved, you not only enter into a new relationship with God, but you enter into a new relationship with sin. Because your heart has been changed. Sin, you will no longer find fun in sin. Sin will break you. I'm not talking about sinless perfection that you don't sin. You will still struggle with sin, but sin will be a struggle to you. Not fun. When you find yourself falling into sin, your heart will be broken and contrite. You will not be defending your sin. You will not be cherishing your sin. In verse 2 and 3 of Genesis, chapter 3, it says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So we see that Eve here answers excellently. Eve, more like corrects the serpent, he repeats what God had told them in chapter 2. She talks about the liberty God had given them in the Garden of Eden. They could eat of every tree with only one exception. You know, It is never a good thing to converse with the devil. Christians are never commanded to talk with the devil. You cannot, you cannot, like you you cannot outcompete the devil when it comes you engaging into conversations with him. You're only setting up yourself to the fall. Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Savior, gave us the example. Jesus can talk to devils. He's God. And even they tremble before him. But you as a human being, even though you're saved, you have no business. Remember, Eve was perfect. None of us is perfect right now. So if Eve failed, how are you going to do? Terribly. So the only thing Satan should hear from us when he starts a conversation is this, get behind me, Satan. That's all. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27, the Bible says, do not give the devil a foothold. When you read 2 Corinthians 3, 11, the Bible says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Don't be ignorant of the schemes of Satan. He will take advantage of you. If here in verse 3 added something to the command in chapter 2, no shall you touch it. So this is an addition. It is possible that Adam may have told this Eve. You know, some people uh, have been reading commentaries uh, through this, and some would suggest that this is really a bad thing. But I don't think it's a bad or sinful thing, because in fact, sin had not happened anyway. Sin had not entered the world. So this wasn't a sinful thing for Adam to do. I believe in my own commentary is this is common sense. If you're commanded not to eat something, why are you touching it? You're told, don't. It's like a child at home. Maybe you have cookies there. And you tell them, you see that jar of cookies? Don't eat any of them. So later, if you find a child touching it, has a cookie in in his hand or in our hand, the child will not convince you that he wasn't planning to eat it. You shouldn't be touching what you shouldn't, what you're not supposed to eat. That means Christians. You know, we always uh, talk to young people here, and always the main topic is about relationships. eh? Relationships. And we always tell them, as a Christian, you shouldn't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. You have no business as a Christian entering into even a romantic relationship with someone who is not of your faith. That is wrong. And they will try to find out justifications. But I will change them. Wow. You have failed to change and you think you want to change someone else. God only changes people. Like, because you're setting up yourself for sin, for rebellion against Christ. So the question asked is, why did God put this tree in the garden in the first place? 
seemed everything was perfect. God would have created a garden without this tree, that tree in the middle which led to all the mess we are in right now. Why in the world did God put this tree in the garden? I believe it was to remind Adam and Eve that they are not God. Neither equal to God. They were to to be reminded that God had a legitimate claim to their obedience. And that they were responsible to him. Yes, they had a free will. They could eat from any other tree except that one. You know, today people, there is a lot of debate about free will and all that. But for me, when I see the pages of scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, man in one sense has a free will. We make choices, free choices. But the only being in the universe who has a free will is God. The Bible says, for our God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. If that statement be placed on any angel or human, where it says, such and such does whatever he pleases, that is sin. God is the only one with the will to which every other creature will conform its will to. Is the absolute will. So in verse 4 and 5, it says, And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So we see that Satan moves on to the next step. His next step is is deliberately attacking the word of God. It's no longer subtle. Now it's direct. Why? Because Eve has kept the conversation going. She has given Satan a foothold. Now he's no longer afraid, like he's now bringing it on. So, you see, at first he tried to make God look mean and his commandments overbearing, but now he's convincing her that in her obedience, her disobedience to God, it is not such a big deal. You know how many people today are bought into the lie that God loves everyone unconditionally. I hear some preachers deceiving millions that God loves everyone unconditionally. Where is that in the Bible? And that you, which actually means you can sin against God and get away with it. Anyway, loves everyone unconditionally. In fact, that's why no wonder people will automatically jump to the conclusion How can a good God like that, who loves everyone unconditionally, send anyone to hell? Since his love is unconditional to everyone, regardless of what they believe, of how they live, whether they have believed in him or not, he loves everyone unconditionally. That God doesn't exist. The true God loves all people. That is clear in the scriptures. God loves each and every one, but not everyone unconditionally. Romans chapter 8 puts the unconditional love in the context only of those who are in Christ Jesus. They are the ones where the Bible says nothing and no one shall separate them from the love of God. Only those. So the unconditional love of God is only for those who have been placed in Christ by their faith in him. So, so many people today are living in rebellion against God. Even among us professing Christians, they live in sin. And somehow they convince themselves that they heard that God is a loving God. He has an obligation to forgive them. You know, most people think on the day of judgment, when God is seated there on the throne and then they show up, they just say, God, I'm sorry. And that will fix it. Yeah, everyone will say they are sorry. That's why when Jesus says, when he paints pictures of hell, he says, in hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. They will be sorry, but it will be too late. It's, I've watched videos of people being brought before human judges where they are being tried for a crime. And later when they are proved guilty, they break down and weep and say, I'm sorry. Of course, the human judge will say, you should be sorry for what you did, but justice demands that you pay. 
So the love of God never cancels out the justice of God. Never. Because God is loving, he must be just. That's why parents who love their children, they will discipline them. There are so many parents who don't want to discipline their children in the name of love. That is not true love. That is sentimentalism. That is not love. In fact, Hebrews 12 tells us, whoever God receives, it disciplines them. And it disciplines us because he loves us. You know, many people, they don't take sin serious. And even us in the church, even us Christians, you know, we justify a lot of things. We say the grace of God. We've had God is a, is a God of grace. Where, where sin abounds, grace abounded much more. So let us go and sin. That is a question asked. Romans chapter 6 verse 1. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, God forbid. How shall we continue to live in sin when we have been set free from it? A Christian doesn't continue to live in sin. First John chapter 3 from verse 4 to 10 expounds on that. And tells you this is the child of God and this is the child of the devil. It has to do with personal practical righteousness. So we, we, trivial, we trivialize sin in our own eyes. We say it's not such a big deal. It's okay. Like I... I I, I can go to such a place. I, I, can, I, I can hang out with such people. I can do whatever I want. It's not such a big deal because it's not such a big deal to me. It shouldn't be such a big deal to God. But I want to remind us this morning. Jesus Christ, actually according to the Bible, Jesus Christ he is the God we are going to stand before for judgment. Oh, people, John chapter 5, Revelation 20 makes it clear. All people are going to be judged by Christ. He is the God who's seated at the white throne of judgment in Revelation, who's going to cast a multitude of people in the lake of fire. This is Jesus. Jesus Christ took sin very serious. Very, very serious. And remember, he's the one who's going to judge us. I'll give you an example. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30 says, If your right eye causes you to sin, Pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. This is the God each and every one is going to stand in judgment. You might not take sin serious, it does. And th this is not some advice Jesus is giving us. It's a command and a warning. We are in the days of grace. But those days are coming to an end. The Bible promises all sinners right now are not converted to flee from the wrath which is coming. The book of Revelation tells you, the catastrophes and the judgments of God which are going to come. And guess what? Many people today have met actually some crazy people. Some, someone even told me he's a Christian. Where he said, you know that God of the Old Testament is a judgmental and angry God. Like, you know, like, but the God of the New Testament, Jesus, is loving. Like, Jesus is the one who is saving everyone. Like, Jesus is the one... In other words, at the back of their mind, they think Jesus is going to let everyone into heaven, regardless of how they lived or how, what they believed. But they forget, actually, after I became a Christian, I was shocked, because I always thought that God of the Old Testament is mainly God the Father. It's like Jesus and the Holy Spirit were standing in the background, and they had not so much to do with what was going on. But I read the book of Jude. I think it's Jude. Jude is only one chapter, around verse 5. Jude writes and says that it is actually Jesus Christ who killed the Jews in the wilderness. You know that God who sent serpents to kill Jews for complaining? Who opened the earth and swallowed the rebels? You know that God? The New Testament is, says it was Jesus. So the angry God, as they say, the angry God of the Old Testament is the God who has nailed at Calvary for the sins of the world. And the scripture, when you read the book of Revelation, 
which the Bible warns that those days which are coming have never been on earth and never shall they happen. That if they were not cut short, no one will survive. But for the sake of the elect of the chosen people of God, they were cut short. And guess what? The book of Revelation, the judgments there, the Bible, do you know the name, the Bible, the book of Revelation calls them, it's called the wrath of the Lamb. So it's the same God. God is one, he's triune, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean Jesus has a separate will from the Father and the Holy Spirit. They all agree a hundred percent on everything. So this account of Genesis is to remind us of how holy God is. This one act of disobedience, which might not be such a big deal for us humans, brought about death, God's curse, and wrath in the world today. You know, it is to remind us that it was one sin which brought all that, that one sin is enough to send each and every one of us to hell. One sin. Because anyone who has fallen short of the glory of God is called a sinner. So, Satan wants us to see sin as something good that a bad God doesn't want us to have. His main lie to us is sin is not bad and God is not good. Because he says to the woman, you will not surely die. They surely died that day, spiritually, because spiritual death is separation from God. But because of God's grace, physical death followed hundreds of years later. You know, that's why John 8 verse 44, Jesus calls Satan a liar and a murderer from the beginning. He led to the death of our first parents and the rest of the human race because of sin. He tells Eve that your eyes will be opened after you know, after eating, their eyes were really opened, but not open to a good thing, but to their own sin, rebellion, and shame. And then he told them, you will be like God. Of course, they were like God in one sense because they were created in the image of God and in the likeness of God. But that's not what Satan wanted them to believe. Satan wants people to believe they are divine. And actually, you know, like, Satan himself personally knew this. When Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 tells us that Satan desired to be like God. And where did that end? He became a devil. And he was cast out of hell. He was an angel of light by creation, but he is now the prince of darkness. Desiring to be like God on your own terms will end in judgment. So today... This doctrine of demons, of wanting to be like God, is alive and well in the world. Not just in cults like Mormonism and the New Age, which is very, uh, when I was in Europe, uh, it seems like New Age is actually, it looks like as it has overtaken Christianity. It's in schools, in therapy centers, like everywhere. Yoga and all these things. People where they are taught actually they are gods. You have a God inside of you. You are part of the God. Whatever that means. You know, this is not just in the world, the unbelieving world, or the false religions of the world, but alive and well in churches today. Today, there are so many false teachers who are teaching through twisting certain scriptures like Psalm 82 and others that actually Christians are little gods. Maybe some of you have been taught this. They will, they, they, this is the satellite of Satan. They will say, no, you are not a capital G God. You are a small G God. This is deception. The scriptures are clear. There is only one God and besides him there is none else. No one becomes God. God did not create gods. Where we, we have ended, because I have to end here because of time. Our time is up. But we see that when people end up totally fallen and where they have turned their backs on God it's a slow fed it's a slow fed it's one compromise which leads to another you know like for many people who hear the word of God like this morning and you know here I've been talking about temptation which led to, to the falling to sin 
You might say, this is far from me. Like we are living thousands of years away from the Garden of Eden. This message is for all of us. For some of you who are saved, this is to remind you that you cannot fight temptation on your own. Satan is too powerful for us. That's why the scripture says that greater is he who is in us. First John chapter 4 verse 4. Than he who is in the world. Satan. The Bible doesn't say greater is us than he who is in the world. Greater is he, Jesus, who is in us than the devil who is in the world. Only Christ, only Christ has the power over Satan. You cannot wrestle with Satan and win as a human. You can't. But the Bible tells us how Satan flees from us. We submit to God and resist the devil and he shall flee from us. So it's my call. Our submission to God is to submit ourselves to his word. The only protection God gave Adam and Eve was his word. The only protection he gives us today is his word. Because Satan knows the Bible more than all of us, at least by memory. He's an angel. But the advantage we have against Satan is this. We have the word of God in our hearts. And that's why David says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. For the race who are not saved, my plea is run to Christ. Whatever you believe in, you know people will boast into religion. The Bible says those who are being saved, they take no confidence in the flesh whatsoever, not even in the law of God. Our confidence is in Christ. We boast only in him. If Jesus is not your righteousness, you're not going to enter heaven. The scripture says, for there is no any other name given to all men under heaven by which you must be saved. And that is Jesus. And we are saved not by works of righteousness we have done, but by grace through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. So Father, we want to bless your name. We want to thank you for, for your word. Lord, your word is true. You have reminded us of the fall. You have reminded us of the devices of Satan. And you call us not to be ignorant of them that you may take advantage of us. That we may not give him a foothold in our lives to lead us into falling. Lord, we ask that you, you help us. Lord, we continue to pray and commit to you. Those who are still lost among us, the Lord, you convict them by your spirit. Show them their need of Jesus. But also we want to pray for the rest of us who have believed. The Lord, you strengthen us. The Lord, we continue to live a life which is in step with repentance a life which is worthy of our calling from you, Lord, that our life will glorify you. Lord, thank you that you are faithful, that even in our times of temptations, you have given us a way of escape. You always give us a way of escape. Thank you that we are not alone. And you say that since we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, even Jesus, the Son of God, who is seated at the right hand of God, he who was tempted in all ways like us, yet he never sinned. The one who can sympathize with our weaknesses. You say that let us come boldly to this throne of grace. That you may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Lord, by your spirit every day draw us before the throne of grace. Because we need it. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.